Okay, so we are in Modern Philosophy Part 2, and this would be the last one for the history of Western philosophy. So, as we know from last time, we're continuing on with the more modern part of modern philosophy. And since Rousseau wrote about his contemporary philosophy, what was important in his time is slightly off in this time. So, some people are more and less important than others. So, what I did was that I slightly reordered the end. So, we're not going to cover every single person that Rousseau talked about. So, we're only going to talk about the important people that was that still remains important in today's contemporary philosophy so this even though we call this part modern philosophy it extends to contemporary philosophy for example Nietzsche who we're going to talk about in the last slide is more of a contemporary philosopher than a modern philosopher but we'll go on that all right so Hegel was the other greatest philosopher of this time so his main idea contrasted with Kant so Hegel is a really interesting person in that his doctrines are even more difficult to understand than Kant. Kant talked about the absolute being and, and morality and his theological arguments. So Hegel's idea was that there was an absolute idea of everything. So this is what he said. He said that if there's a sentence, for example, I am a man, that sentence was interconnected to every other part in the universe for it to make sense. For example, if you say I am a man, you have to define what a man is. In that case, a man could only be defined from its opposites or its degrees, for example, a woman or a child. In that case, to know what that is, you have to or um, you have to inspect all the aspects of that kind of parts of the world as well. For example, if it's a child, you have to see what makes a child, school, play, activity. In that way, a single sentence will link to every single term. Of the universe and if we if so therefore what we say when we mean a sentence that we are aware of every single thing in the universe and we actually know everything about it so his idea was that if you're gonna express an idea it has to be about the every single aspect of the universe for it to make sense there's some controversy over it but we're not gonna go over that we're just gonna cover Hegel's idea and his relations with what he talked about any other aspects of Hegel is that he talked about the development of philosophy as well as history. So his idea of development of philosophy development of history coincides with the ideas that were popular more in the eighteenth and seventeenth century. He argued that history developed and that as culture made sense, what happened was that culture began to develop more and more and with more acceleration. So there's the Egypt and there's Greece and that developed slowly. Mesopotamia, that was the slow civilization to start. But as we get together as we got together to Europe and China in the modern days, what's going on is that the acceleration is speeding up and then it's developing as well. Hegel doesn't give a reason of why some why the history is speeding up or why it's developing. It's just it fits his philosophy to say that everything is becoming universal because and following the idea everything is universal in the first place. So eventually history of everything will become universal. Russell remarked that the only way it explains that developments of society is speeding up, given that it even exists, is that the only possible solution would be the universe is slowly learning Hegel's philosophy, so it's speeding itself up for development. Of course, this makes no sense, but Hegel's ideas was basically about the absolute everything, the one. And he was not the last person in the philosophy to represent such a person. After Hegel, the, uh, philosophy began to more focus on the parts than rather than the one. So another person important in this period would be Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer regarded himself as Kant's follower, but he was so unrecognized in this time. It's kind of a funny story, actually, if not tragic. He argued, his behavior, he really acted like Kant. He woke up, he did everything except wake up in the morning. He took daily walks, he tried to um, exercise morality, he tried to do everything that Kant did, and he published several books following the works of Kant, but they were so un unrecognized in his time that even though he called himself a follower of Kant, which is likely, he didn't really get internationally recognized. And even after his death, Schopenhauer is popular, but not as popular as the original idea so Kant was more positive in his regard remember that his proof for God was one about positivity he argued that there's always good in the universe so what's gonna happen is that there has to be God because there's good because good exists in the world and eventually evil will get punished and good will belong but Schopenhauer viewed in a slightly different manner he did believe in Kant's metaphysics and about the laws and whatnot, but instead of and agreed that there was a universal will, but instead of saying that there was a universal will for good, Schopenhauer argued that it was a universal will for suffering, of pain and evil, and he argued that people's gods isn't the good god who punishes evil and rewards good, but it's the opposite. 
It's a God who allows evil in this world, and that's the only possible way this world can be explained. And if you look into his doctrines, you can see that his path takes a really similar one to Buddhism of what happened. He argues that every life is suffering, that everybody suffers, and that the only way to do it is to give up desire. So his idea of pessimism actually led him in a Buddhist religion, a Buddhist way, which is exactly what he embraces. He argues that Buddhism is the way, and that if you give up desire, that should be what the answer to the solution of all the problems in life. Of course, his behavior itself didn't really reflect that. He always ate in good restaurants, he dined, he clothed finely, but the main point in, it's that Schopenhauer was a more pessimistic follower of Kant, and he developed Kant's theory in a way that followed Kant, but got, we got rid of the more specific, more controversial ideas, and instead I argued that everything was pessimistic in the metaphysical sense, not the more moral sense, although that also applies as well. So Nietzsche is the greatest philosopher, in my opinion, of the 20th century. So I could go on for hours about Nietzsche, but what's most important is that he argued that the will of individuals was the most important thing. He was grew up in a Christian environment. His family was Christian, his sister was Christian, everybody he knew was Christian, and he even went to a Christian school. But he wrote the most major Christian, what's it called, Christian anti-doctrine this time, titled the Antichrist, and he titled any attack Christian's history as being an uh, un, undistinguished religion, something that's so mundane, something that should have been wiped out, except it applied to the weak, the poor. Nietzsche's main argument is that individuals proceed, and what happens is that when they proceed, they need power, and that they work for power, and that's how society should work. So. People like Schopenhauer would argue that suffering makes up the entirety of society and that what we need to do is get rid of suffering, but Nietzsche enjoys the suffering. He's not a sadist in the fact that he enjoys suffering of others, but he believes that suffering is the only way humans will progress. Nietzsche's idea of Ubermenschen, the Superman, is that eventually he'll be the worst possible human in society. He just relies on his instincts, his base, his bases to do whatever he needs and in Nietzsche's opinion that's the best kind of human being. Someone who's not restrained by society, who's free. So this is kind of following the romantic ideal but more towards self-development. He argues that there's always the mass, the, the poor, the uneducated and there's always the elites who stand above him and Nietzsche stands for the elites in the fact that he supports them. The utilitarianism supported for poor and the masses, but that's not too important in, this, in the Western philosophy that we're talking about. So Nietzsche argued that the only way society will progress is that if you allow this elites to take over and that the masses should be prevented from being grouping together and taking over one or two elites. His idea was basically of the most perfect human being was the human being that fits the most animals. And that is the end of Western philosophy. Thank you for listening to the lecture so far.